Um, <clears throat> this exhibition, Wonderfully Tactile, um, curated by Carl, is what we precisely need at this time. Entering our third year of the pandemic, we as humans have gone to have had to contend with the notion of tactility and how the sensation is being mediated through technological means or by abstention. Um, our sense of sociability has dematerialized as we go into Zoom rooms. Our sense of touch is mediated by our vision, reinforcing the dynamic of the haptic in our socially distant world. As the moderator for this talk, um, I want us to think about how our senses of touch and sight are colluding, collaborating, or undermining how we perceive the material world. The artists in this exhibition have given us exciting ways to experience the haptic, the way we touch with our eyes. Becca Baroli's sculpture is an evocative engagement with fabrication, not in the usual sense of making textiles, but using the methods of fabrication like weaving to fabricate in metal and rubber tubing. Adam Bernard's work break up the painting surface with thousands of individual marks in the form of dots of various weight. The overall effect is an illusion of an amalgamated unified fields of color. Anne Finholt reciprocates the energy she receives from her environment. Her gestural work is the physical expression of what she observed and absorbed from her visual experiences. Mary Janicek's project has the immediacy of color and material and rooted within the current, within current events. Yet it has this subtle and accidental borrowing of painterly language from 17th century Dutch genre paintings like ruffles, folds, richness of texture and austerity of palette. Stephen Main, in borrowing the methods of printmaking, destabilizes the visual field through a misalignment of registrations, creating ghostly, vibrant, colorful light casts. John Ralston V imagines the edge of what is perceived and presents, and presents us how delightful these interlands are. Vibrant, sumptuous protrusions amid cracked surfaces are visions of new landscape that combat our natural surroundings. Deborah Weisberg's embossed monoprints set the foundation upon which she builds occlusions, a series of closures and openings that navigate the eye between seeing and touching. Margaret Wilson's blue miniatures are embodiments and expressions of the desire for human touch. Through precise lines of markers against the fluidity of oil paints, figures emerge from the azure surface like Aphrodite born from the sea. So these are just some thoughts that I wanted to share about how I spent time with the work. Um, you know, unfortunately, I haven't been to the gallery to see it in person, but you know, I really tried to spend a lot of time zooming in um, visually with with the you know with the with the JPEGs just to really get in touch with the with the textures and the tactility and the and really ruminating on that notion of the haptic um, with this work. So what I'm going to do is just going to ask two questions, and um, and all the artists can answer, and then um, maybe I will call in one person, and then the next the, the, none of the artists will call in the next, so that we can just get the ball rolling, and then after that we will open it up to the audience. <clears throat> so my first question is, what is your relationship with your material? Is it an easy kind of love? or a laborious fatal attraction. Um, let's start with John. Hi everyone, I'm John Ralston. Um, so these pieces uh, are all kind of different varied mixes of water and uh, a kind of fake plaster uh, that, is then mixed with latex paint um, in, in kind of like really high volumes and quantities. Uh, it's a material I've been working with for probably about 11 years now. Um, and uh, one of the things that I really try to employ <clears throat> with my works is using every piece of what 
uh, I kind of interact with when I'm making these works. Uh, a lot of a lot of what you see is is formed from uh, tooling and friction and creating these kind of cracked bits that are arranged in wetter substrate um, and, and left to dry. So I'm I'm experimenting with uh, kind of uh, time as well as uh, the material. Um, <clears throat> I use these materials regularly in my occupation. I am uh, a renovation project manager. So I fix um, historic homes here in Baltimore, Maryland. And uh, these materials are kind of things that <laughs> I wake up in the morning thinking about and um, it's not very romantic, I would say. It's, <laughs> it's, more, it's, it's more of, you know, this study and uh, attempt of departure from recognizability. Um, uh, I'm, I'm very heavily influenced by South American geometric abstractionists, the theory of the non-object. Um, and uh, some of the kind of minimalism associated with Donald Judd being written at the same time. And um, I'm trying to push this material as far as it can go. Uh, and, you know, I have plans to institute completely different effects using uh, gravity spin um, <clears throat> in the future. So it's, it's, um, it's just a continual development, I would, I would say, is like the most accurate description of my relationship with my material. And, and one of the things I, I always try to portray is like there is no kind of like failure point. There's just a, a way of reusing and repurposing these pieces into a, a newer and better work. And, you know, like so, some of these are made of uh, like chunks that are years and years old. Um, that you know just collect dust in a bucket for <laughs> most of its lifetime and it's, it's it's always delightful to kind of like grab this neglected thing and uh, transform it into something that makes me happy you know it's uh, <clears throat> so but you know it, it, I think it is kind of the most important factor of my work the materiality like what I'm able to express with the you know evacuation of water from these uh these kind of pieces. <clears throat> Thanks, John. Um, Anne? Call on the next person? Oh, you call on the next person. <laughs> <laughs> sure. OK. So I, <clears throat> I work with oil pastels and have for um, about three years. Although I've been working with um, this particular kind of oil pastel, this particular brand called um, Sennelier um, pastels um, most recently. And they're my preferred pastel. They're very, they're very soft. They're like a very soft crayon. Um, and that gives me a lot of flexibility in terms of how I want to use them. I can't say that I don't bump into them every once in a while and bump into their limitations um, because um, oil pastels dry at an excruciatingly slow pace. Um, five years from now, I'm not sure that they'll still be dry. So that means that they have to be um, framed to present them. But that same slow, pace of drying means that I can scrape them, I can wipe them out. I, they're incredibly flexible in terms of what I can do with them. They, uh, because they are shaped like a crayon, um, that means that I sometimes have a, I use them like a drawing material sometimes, but they're also um, have the ability to make large, big, um, areas. Um, I also find that 
sometimes I feel like I, I don't have the same kind of um, color range that I might get if I were using paint. But most often, I think that those challenges are just are challenges to me to figure out how to use the material better. And what I part of what I like is that the surface gets built up and it gets very um, rich and um, and the range can span from being really um, dark and musky to very light and luminous. Um, and those are the things that, and I appreciate that range um, for, for my work. Because I, I, the gesture is really important to me, the fact that they are so fluid and they respond so quickly to whatever my hand or arm is doing, <clears throat> also gives them an added appeal um, to me. So I guess that's, um, I guess that's my response about the materials. Thanks, Anne. Mm -hmm. um, Becca? Hi. Um, so yeah, I work predominantly with a uh, steel wire, a needle steel. Um, I think my relationship is probably both an easy kind of love and a laborious fatal attraction. I really consider it to be sort of a negotiation with the material. Um, wire comes really tightly coiled and it holds on to that coil. And it also has this really stubborn property to it where like the more you bend it, the more resistant it gets to further bending. Um, it's called work hardening. Um, so I, you know, I try to work within the limitations of how it wants to behave and sort of influence what I want to do with it. And I make a lot of these forms like this piece is uh, like a round process, go around and around, and that kind of mimics the coil of it. So uh, material is definitely a big factor in the forms that I make. And it, at this point, I'm pretty much only working with steel wire. So um, definitely have some kind of obsession with it. Um, as far as it enforcing tactility in art, yeah, so, so this is a piece from grad school. I went to the San Francisco Art Institute and uh, I was just kind of collecting materials that I was drawn to. And I noticed at one point they were all just coiled materials and kind of rough, uh, like industrial construction kind of materials. This one is soaker tubing that's made out of recycled tires. So it, it has like a, it's like a rope burn, but with the tire rubber and it's, it's kind of gnarly. Um, so yeah, like my work has a range, I think of being really tight or loosening up and probably mostly toward the tighter end of that spectrum. Um, but I use a lot of um, textile based processes. Like this piece is made from uh, just repeating latch hook knots that I tied around a foundation that I made on a frame loom, which is um, you know, a more traditional part of weaving. So um, there's definitely evidence of the hand and in that repetition, there's evidence of labor. And I think that those things are, um, yeah, definitely reinforced in the tactility. Um, it, it's one of the most common questions people ask is like, how are your hands? Are your hands okay? Are you taking care <laughs> of your hands? And, and it, you know, it's, it's a, a labor of love kind of thing. Um, a lot of repetition, a lot of, um, kind of arbitrary cutoff points. Like this piece has 400 of these pieces. I call them scribble pieces. These ones happen to be made of five foot long braids. So it's just a very repetitive, um, almost factory like process. And, and this piece, I'll get into the idea. It's called better half um, because I kind of want to push back against these assumptions of like what's feminine, what's masculine, what's hard, what's soft. And, and for this one, it's really like this rigid uh, uniform repetition versus this like ripped and torn or you could say damaged side and I wanted to really leave it to the viewer to decide which is the better half so thanks 
Hi, Deborah. Hi. Hey, <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to echo Becca's, um, you know, because I come from a sculpture background. So, um, you know, I feel like I also uh, have that kind of love and hate, like paper itself is a very simple material. It doesn't, you know, and I feel like I'm constructing with the paper. I mean, it doesn't have its, it, I, I'm using it in a kind of a sculptural way with it, the layering that I'm kind of doing with it. But, you know, you can also, so I, I want this very dynamic, busy surface. And, and I also have this iconography that's this frenetic energy and my struggle, you know, I, I love that, um, kind of tactility, but the struggle with it is to contain it. So to organize it, to, you know, to uh, uh, give it shape and form so that it doesn't, you know, so that it has uh, uh, a clarity um, and, a, and, a, and a force that's, that's rich. And, you know, so it's that, you know, I can kind of get lost in, uh, in the material um, and, because it, you know, I can almost, you can, you know, it, it'll just responds to my hand so quickly. Now what, how I, how I do it, um, I start with uh, putting my work, um, deconstructing my sculptures and my installations. And then I run them through the, I ink it and run them through the press. So I get a, um, uh, both an embossing and a, a print of it. And, um, and then I just, I don't work traditionally you know, as a traditional printmaker, uh, I, I don't really have the technique or the background. I just get these repository of images and then I start building them together, you know, tearing, I deconstruct it again. Um, and then, um, you know, searching for that amalgamation of image, um, tactility, um, collaging on top of it, uh, you know, so there's, there's an kind of an archeological layering after layer after layer. Um, and um, I'm hoping that that richness of surface um, heightens the emotional quality and intensity in the work. So, um, but I can't say that it's not a struggle because I'm kind of, you know, excavating what that imagery where that, that those relationships are. And then, you know, then even excavating, what is the shape that it's gonna take? Cause I very rarely work on a, um, a rectangle. So um, I kind of um, have to have that interplay of the forces on the outside, um, uh, managing the forces of the outside with the forces and the imagery on the inside and the surface of it as well. I think I think all I think that's like kind of a thread with all, all of us that I'm hearing this kind of, you know, um, having this relationship or trying to um, have these materials yield to our hands and then accepting the accidents that happen through the materiality mm -hmm. and then going with it. So it's a kind of, uh, you know, you know, a spontaneity mixed with uh, years of um, knowledge and history with with the work and the materials. I think that's a good segue into Stephen, Stephen's work. Um, <clears throat> yeah, thanks. I um, I uh, make these paintings, they're acrylic paintings, and I make them using, um, as Rico alluded to, uh, 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 they're relief prints, essentially. Um, and I started working this way many years ago when I realized that I was really um, not that interested in reinventing the compositional, reinventing the compositional wheel every time I wanted to make a painting. I was really interested in, in looking at color relationships. So um, I uh, gravitated to this way of working where there's a, a composition, aside from color, the composition is embedded in the plate. Um, and uh, it's sort of a, uh, you know, Andy Warhol, Campbell soup can kind of um, paradigm where it's the same structure uh, or the given plate yields the same structure uh, multiple times, but I, I um, vary the palette a lot. Um, 
And um, the the thing that you can't see from photographs is the is the quality of the glaze versus um, I don't think you can I can because I know it's there I don't think uh, without prior knowledge of the painting you wouldn't be able to tell that the the ground color generally is a glaze so there's a lot of a lot of light bouncing up off the gesso underlying white gesso a lot of luminosity and then the additional um, uh, hits as it were of color uh, those are tend to be um, opaque body color uh, so reflecting light, the glaze kind of refracts light, the body color reflects light. So there's light coming into your, your visual field um, uh, in two really different ways. And I think that's part of, um, for me, the interest in the work. The tactility of it, which is, which is pronounced, especially in this one, um, is almost a, like a byproduct of this process, this printing process. Um, uh, it's necessarily going to, with the paint-laden plate comes down against the, onto the canvas and then pull it up again, there's going to be this kind of stamp, there's going to be this kind of residue, actually these paintings are called residue paintings, because it's really a residue of this process. Um, and I've, um, as to the, this issue of the struggle, I, 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 uh, I try not to struggle at all. I try to minimize the struggle. Um, uh, I'm, um, uh, I'm, I've, 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 uh, how to put it, I've, um, refined this process, I mean, refined, right, in quotes, this process, because to the point that I have so that it's really, so that it's really easy and a pleasure to, to do. Um, it's physical, it's, it's, uh, work and all that, but it's not, um, uh, I, I envy John uh, having no fail, having no failure point. Boy, I wish that were true. I mean, I I end up tossing a lot of these, you know. But um, <clears throat> uh, if they're not working out, but I I've always maintained that the dumpster is a, tra a tragically underutilized studio tool, you know. <laughs> um, so out they go. If, if I'm not if I'm not enjoying it, um, then I I scrap it and start over again. Um, the the issue of tactility and abstraction is a really good is a really good question too, or a really good angle on this question. I think that when when subject matter um, uh, is uh, when subject matter is not a part of the picture, then the the formal qualities are going to be more prominent, whether that's tactility or color or scale or or uh, when you're not reading the painting for for um, subject matter. Um, necessarily the formal, ah, nice. Thank you for the placement by that window. I love that wall so much. I like the bot, I like the effect of the, the light bouncing off the floor. They always look kind of like underlit, like it's a, they're on stage or something, you know, the footlights. <laughs> I digress. I guess I'm about done anyway. <clears throat> yeah, let's, let's go to Mary. So Mary's palette is slightly different from yours, Stephen. So let's hear what her relationship with her materials are. Hey, um, it's interesting to me that so many of us have a background in printmaking. That was um, my original background. Um, so yeah, I've been working in paper for years before this. I'm also interested in this idea of love. If I think if, if I would say anything about love and relationship to this these particular works it was more of like a breakup series <laughs> i had been working on a series before this that was very 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 meticulous um which i really love and yeah i kind of get lost in the process of things which i think is still happening in this work but um during the pandemic it just felt like i just kind of didn't have the bandwidth to be that meticulous and so most of all, I think all of the pieces in, in the show are ripped pieces. So these are all, this is all paper that has been ripped down and then just looped and then stapled. And a lot of this is um, then sprayed. I went to like the dollar store and got some <laughs> spray bottles and it's liquid watercolor just sprayed onto the paper. And it was like a hot mess. <laughs> it was <laughs> like the <laughs> furthest thing from the tigulous. I had like a um, my studio at the time, I had like a tarp on the wall so I could just spray relentlessly watercolor all over these things. 
um, which was like just a, just such a departure from the work I had been doing. Um, I don't know if I loved it, <laughs> but it was definitely cathartic and maybe love is complicated like that. Um, and it definitely helped me like work out a number of things in my head um, and in, in space. Um, and as far as like, I'm really, what you're talking about, all the, what everyone's saying about this like tactile experience and that in relationship to abstraction, I guess I keep thinking about like my daughter who's 11 was in my studio today and she was touching some of my work and she was like, I'm so lucky I get to touch this. <laughs> she was like, when you go to a gallery, you don't get to touch anything. Um, and I teach kids a lot. And so much of what we tell kids about art is like, you know, you know can you feel it with your eyes? Um, and what, what an amazing show to just sort of like focus on that. And like the thing about embracing abstraction is like when you get, like when you no longer have to think about your work and as a standard of whether or not it's realistic, then you get to think about these things of like, what does it feel like to your eyes? You know, you get to really explore like this visceral experience um, when you let go of this pictorial space. Um, yeah, so I hope that helps to answer some of, yeah, some of this is actually canvas, I forgot. So it's two of, I think two of the works are ripped canvas. Um, they're also sprayed with watercolors as well. Um, yeah. Great, thanks, Mary. So my second question, some of you have already addressed a little bit. Um, my second question is, does abstraction enforce and reinforce the tactile in works of art? And, and particularly in this show, I felt like there was a really strong connection between abstraction and tactility. Um, so maybe we'll start with Deborah, um, who has addressed that question. Um, you know, it's a great question. And, you know, it, in this show, it's, it's true. Uh, and I, and I <clears> think <throat> Stephen really nailed it when he was saying that. But, you know, when you think about art history, uh, you know, all the, uh, you know, like a kind of geometry of minimalism, all that, you know, that, you know, that's pure abstraction and it has no tactility. So there's a whole tradition of it, uh, you know, not that, it, it, that it's just devoid of entry of any, any surface. Um, but for me, I mean, I think um, what I, uh, removing the the you know a, spe a specificity of imagery in my work for me allows a kind of metaphoric reading with a lots of things you know and a, which I you know so because people do see things in my work you know allusions to uh, root systems or dendrite biological or cosmic whatever it is and I think that um, comes through. So I mean, you know, we're playing around with what is abstraction because there are metaphoric reasons, uh, uh, metaphoric connections with um, the, the observable world that I filter through and you know break it down into another kind of language. So I think for all of us, it might be slightly different how we define this kind of abstractionism. Um, I think, you know, so I think that's about it for me, yeah. But I do agree with Stephen in some ways, but by kind of, you know, not having something that's specifically observable, it, it can um, heighten the, uh, how, we, how we rely or how we use um, this kind of surface tension. What about you, John? Um, I think abstraction, uh, definitely emotes tactility, this kind of haptic sense that you're talking about, you know, even in kind of simple geometric terms. Um, I think that the way that, you know, if you look at like how blind people interpret text, um, shapes themselves visually, you know, uh, conference with a 
different mode of I I think like a cone feels feels away like a, a corner something sharp um, all of those things connote a a very uh, almost primal uh, perception to me and <clears throat> when I make work I spend a lot of time thinking about how materials separate from each other um, what happens to things if they dry over a long period of time for, versus a short period of time. And uh, it, when you are creating something that doesn't come from like identifiable gesture or um, <clears throat> isn't referential, it, I think it, it immediately kind of bores itself into your animal brain and that you rely on your <clears throat> uh, baser instincts to interpret what it is. A lot of times people look at my work and tell me that looks like a dog or that looks like a cloud or, you know, like this is a, this looks like a maraca. Like there's a lot of shape relationship that like, you know, I think that when you kind of disrupt um, people's conceptual uh, environment and try to take them somewhere else, like they immediately resort to uh, <clears throat> experiences and memories. And um, that, that feeling is only really associated with like the kind of like unsettling and unknowing of an image or a, an object, a sculpture, a painting and not necessarily one that is trying to tell you something. So yes, I, I think that abstraction is, abstraction heightens all of those perceptions, like the, the, the feeling of sight, the, the, the sound of a point. Um, like, you know, I think that those things connote like, like an interaction in, in your head. <clears throat> is that the same for you, Anne? Um, no, <laughs> <I don't. laughs> um, I, when you first posed that question, I think I interpreted it um, a bit differently. And I was, and I, at first I thought, well, I don't think something has to be abstract to be tactile. And then I started thinking of the number of artists from art history, that fall into that might fall into that category, starting with maybe Franz Halls or moving then to Frank Auerbach contemporarily, whose um, work has great gesture, but also Frank Auerbach, very thick paint. Mm -hmm. But those artists move in, move into abstraction. They have retained some their, their reference points, but they're moving into abstraction. So in the end, I'm not sure that, um, that there is this kind of tactility with, without abstraction. Although I don't think that it has to be, I don't think all abstraction is tactile That's right. by any means. I, I think there's a great deal of it that's very connected to the surface and um, you don't have that sense of touch when when you're looking at it. So I don't think that the abstraction necessarily reinforces or enforces um, the tactile sense. But I, I do think that there's very, that there's little that has that sense of touch that isn't abstract. That, that brings up a, this third thought that I had just by listening to everybody speak is that there's the need for tactility then make abstraction indexical. So what I mean is that because of the textures and the, and the, and the surface and, and sort of the tactile aspects of it, does it make abstraction more something like a pointer to something referential, something that is referenced, like what John said, like, it looks like something else. So is it indexical? Does it point to something else? Because we desire that kind of tactility um, in the work. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think, you know, that I wish, I wish visual language had the freedom that music has, where you just have an embodiment experience mm -hmm. and you don't have to decode it linguistically. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not sure how we got here with language and art, you know, where in some, in some instances, the language <laughs> of the art takes over the art, um, you know, uh, and that's never been the case, you know, in music. Uh, I mean, there's writings about music, but not at the same time that you're listening to the music. And, um, you know, uh, so, um, you know, I just, I, yeah, so I, this whole idea of the pure abstraction, um, I, I wish people could just, I, I think it is possible to have that experience of immersion into, into a visual experience, but it's, it's hard. It's hard for people just to, to give it, to give it up to it, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> to give it over. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's, you think it's more of a, a function of humans desire to kind of make a reference as opposed to just enjoying the abstraction itself. I think, it, I don't know, Rika, I don't know if it's our educational system. I don't know if it's how art is taught or, mm -hmm. you know, the whole, museum experience with a docent, you know, decoding it for you. I, I don't know if it's, you know, if it's just really a biological thing that people <laughs> want to make sense of the visual. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it's a Western thing. I don't know, and you know, it's, I have a lot of questions. Um, mm -hmm. Did we construct this yeah. uh, system? And now, you know, unfortunately, I think, uh, were the victims of it that people just mm. spend a second looking at something and then they read the text to see if they you know did they get it right you know mm -hmm. or the, or like where is Waldo you know I feel like they look at <laughs> it and they look back and did I get it did I get an A you know did I see everything I'm supposed to see um, mm -hmm. I think and you know I I don't know a lot of questions I have about that but I know music I just wish it, you know music has such a freedom and it's so democratic in some ways you know uh, in that. In our in how we experience it and we don't try to did we get it right kind of system you know we just feel it becca do you get a lot of that with your work do people say that it looks like something else um not in terms of like a pictorial image but it, like it looks like box springs or chicken wire or you know something i i find this sort of conversation comes from people who don't look at a lot of art and I think that abstraction in particular is definitely uh, more likely to be considered by people who have spent time with art or are willing to spend time with something. It's not an immediate reading. And um, yeah, I agree. I, I think like I have a hard time thinking it's just abstraction that could do this or, you know, other things aren't capable of doing this because for me that indexical trace of like time and the hand and the haptic mm -hmm. that to me comes a lot from process and and just the well for a while like the sharp and the hardness of the material that it makes it makes even people who don't look at art question those things and I think that when you remove uh like a an image or like a recognizable image at least then it leaves room to kind of have these conversations about what is, uh, you know, cause it's like, you wanna have some kind of question or response when you look at something, whether you've been educated on that or not, I think. Um, but yeah, I, you know, you get a range of comments of what, <laughs> what it is, or what the reaction is. And uh, what about Mary? I mean, maybe, I don't know, for my work, I mean, because it does, I've been looking at clouds, so it has been sort of based on, like, I guess, a, a certain um, point from which it's abstracted the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, and it's sort of like, um, the thing is, is that when you look in your mind's eye, it's sort of how you see it. 
right? <laughs> like, yes. like your memory is abstract. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I think of that a lot when I'm making this work. And I think a lot, it was interesting to me how you compared it to Dutch painting, because I do think a lot about the history of painting and the history of pictorial space and like how, how we've been making these illusions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like, like the history of painting is the history of illusion. Um, mm -hmm. And these illusions have like rules and different cultures have different rules for these illusions of pictorial space. Um, and then it's like now, you know, in sort of like this globalization moment that we are in where we know each other's rules <laughs> and the history of each other's rules. And, um, you know, how, how do we recreate that? Um, I think it's really interesting, just sort of like, as someone who spends a lot of time, like looking at art. Um, that said, like, I, I don't hang out with a lot of artists. <laughs> I feel like I end up, I end up showing my work to a lot of people who aren't um, like authorities and looking at art. Um, and they definitely always you know, maybe the same way an artist would bring their own point of view to it. Um, you know, like this looks like um, water, you know, when I didn't intend that, <laughs> you know, or this, you know, this reminds me of, you know, some memory they have of some environment. Um, and it's a tricky thing, I think, for, for whether or not you make representational or abstract work to make room for the viewer to bring in themselves without diluting your your own work um so yeah i guess i guess it's another tangent though and steven yeah that's uh, something i'd like to pick up on actually mary i think it's a really important point or uh it sounded pompous i think it's an interesting avenue to 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 go down i i um uh and it ties into what deborah was talking about as far as like the uh, the the um, uh, reluctance or or maybe the um, unfamiliarity a lot of people have with treating a painting or sculpture as a visual purely visual experience as you might treat a musical experience is something that's you know exper experiential to primarily um, um, I um, but I'm also interested in what people you know what people because we're, you know, this this death of the author thing uh, tells us that you know uh, the 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 content meaning is in the mind of the of the of the perceiver, the reader, and um, uh, I get um, people always want to see maps mm -hmm. in my paintings. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and that's and on the one hand, it's it's. Um, Great, they're looking. You know, uh, if it looks like a map, okay, fine. But, but sometimes I just want to shake them. And say <laughs> it's not a map, okay? Yeah. Trust me, I know because I did it. And then I think, well, does that really give me any any right to say that I know? Does the artist have the last word? We know the artist doesn't have the last word. But a um, uh, little sore spot, perhaps you can tell. <laughs> um, um, no, I mean I love it. I love when people get engaged and they start to see stuff. But it's but it's the it is the Where's Waldo effect. It's like what the hey, there's a there's a picture in there somewhere. I just know there are iconophiles. People tend to be iconophiles and mm -hmm. want to see um, want to see some kind of uh, recognizable imagery. And maybe it is a maybe it is a survival thing. You know from. Mm -hmm eons ago, needing to see the tiger lurking in the bushes, you know, mm -hmm. it's a matter of survival. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But I um, it's more of American thing, Stephen, you know what I mean? I mean, I'm not quite sure that it's, you know, it's all people, you know, I wonder if it's, you know, United States, you know, kind of, you know, because I don't know if that's, I haven't been to Japan, you know, I haven't been to a lot of places, but I, I, I suspect that sometimes in other cultures, um, it's more acceptable. I think people want to be able to get it. I mean, I think there's something maybe about capitalism or, you know, or getting it right or being right. And they want to yes. match it, you know, so. Yes, that could very well be. I've heard people tell me, people who have European collectors, which I don't, 
but uh, people who have European collectors tell me that the European collectors tend to want to uh, live with art in order to try to understand it. Right. Like the Americans fall in love with it, need to have it. The Europeans uh, need to have something, want to live with something, need to continue to consider something that they can't get their mind around. Yeah. So maybe, maybe there is a cultural right. difference yeah. that way. So um, I'm going to open it up to the audience. And before we go to the audience questions, um, one of our fellow artists who uh, could not be here did pass on along, pass along a question. And she wanted to know if, um, if you listen to music, do you listen to music when you work and what kind of music? Let's start with Mary. <laughs> You know, honestly, it's funny that we're talking so much about language because I'm when I'm working, I have to listen to people talking. Like, so I listen to a lot of podcasts when I'm working. Um, yeah, and I almost need language going in order to get to the part of my brain that like can tap into the things that language can't reach. I don't know how else to say it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so yeah, that's what I listen to, podcasts. Anybody else? I don't listen to music, but I'm prone to listening to NPR. Mm. So more talking. <laughs> yes, more talking. Yeah. I, listen, I listen to music. I definitely, I mean, I'll, I used to not be able to listen to any language at all when I was working. And now I do, you know, sometimes listen to podcasts, but I do listen to a lot of classical music or um, jazz, um, you know, yeah. And I can't listen, uh, to something in my ear when I have, you know, any, anything in my ear, when it gets almost in my head, I can't work with it. It has to be, you know, um, just through speakers. When I wear the ear, earbuds, it just like somehow it gets into my brain waves and it prevents me from working. I end up talking to myself a lot. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't working. No, you're an idiot. <laughs> John, you were about to listen to music. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I listen to a lot of music and I, I think it's like a, you know, <laughs> I, I would I would challenge that there's 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 nothing appealing about some of it at some points. You know, it, it's kind of meant to act as a disruption um, to break the tunnel vision that I typically <laughs> get into. And uh, you know. It's like almost like an adjutant in a way while I'm working. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And Becca, did you have a, a, a response to the music question? Sure. Um, I think I mostly listen to like, um, like crime shows and like <laughs> real trials. I feel like it puts me in like the right kind of psychological space to be like, <laughs> And uh, or just like really moody or like angry, like punk rock or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a, that's so interesting. Yeah. So there's one there's one question in the in the chat. Do you think titles that reveal intention impose on the viewer's interpretation? And I would start with John because. I really love the titles and sort of the evocative nature of how he titles the work. So uh, I title my work uh, based off of um, kind of constructed environments within a, a narrative that I've been writing for a very long time. And uh, these are kind of places, symbols, elements from this universe that I've been building for uh, many, many years. <clears throat> so they're, they're meant to kind of like reciprocate the uh, alien nature of, of what you're seeing, the kind of color not combinations that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like don't necessarily fit in our na own natural environments. But at the same time, <clears throat> copy geographic and topographical uh, elements that uh, bring us to our world and that that creates this vibrating friction in a way from what you're seeing and uh, its relationship to um, 
um, <clears throat> what it actually is. Uh, this year, I'm kind of working on developing the actual writing a little bit more. So um, I'm kind of in a very exciting time of like actually transmuting this into uh, something physical. I'm very excited to give these a little bit more conceptual relevance, I would say. But yes, I, I am imposing. <laughs> <laughs> I am taking you to where I'm going. Sorry. <laughs> you have to come with me. <laughs> yeah. no, but the thing is, I don't know. You know, when I looked at your titles, I didn't even, it just became more ambiguous, actually, for me. It wasn't, it wasn't revealing because I didn't know what you were talking about. I didn't know if you made up these places. Um, you know, I, I so. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, didn't it didn't illuminate like more of like this relationship to the observable landscape. Yeah. At so all because of, uh, you know. The, the kind of larger picture the 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 grand summation i would say is um it's it's describing the kind of ether in science fiction i, I don't know how familiar <laughs> it, it once it climbs to a certain point it reveals characters that kind of master their own universe that uh <clears throat> have control over time and place and the, the, the fiction concerns itself with like what their conflicts look like, like what their organization as a society would look like. So it's, it's meant to be um, jarring, unsettling, kind of looking like something unplaceable. It's, I'm trying to bring it even further that way, I would say, definitely. Oh. I think I need um, lessons on how to um, extract titles from the work because <laughs> I'm really conflicted about my titles. My I use them; they're they're quite literal in terms of where I've started the work, but I've deliberately taken it someplace else, and then I feel like I'm pulling the viewer back into where I started. And I don't necessarily like that. But I don't, but I don't, I haven't gotten an alternative. I'm title impaired here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just number, number my work, you know, collage, embossing, blah, blah. And the only reason I title is because one time a reviewer for the Globe said to me, Deborah, I can't you review your work because everything's untitled one, untitled two, you know, so I got into this habit of trying to make up names and it was, a, it was so hard for me to do that. I just couldn't figure it out. So, you know, once in a while I'll give it a name, but mostly it's just like, I, I, I'm back to numbering things. And, um, uh, cause if your brain doesn't think in those terms, uh, it just becomes really forced, but I know people, just for cataloging, well, they want they want you know something uh, to identify the piece. You can't just put untitled. Mm -hmm. I guess you could if you're super famous or something, but you know, um, you know, I think just for, yeah, it just hasn't. A, it's just easier for bookkeeping in some ways to have <laughs> titles. Did anybody else want to address that um, question? Um, there's just like a, I think, a technical question or practical question um, on the question Q&A. Maybe Carl or um, Judy can answer this. Will we be able to touch the works in the exhibit? <laughs> no, unfortunately not. Touch it with your eyes. <laughs> yes, we'll, 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 we'll practice our haptic sensibilities and touch with our eyes. Can we get a lot of work be touched? I, I would not be opposed to having mine touched. And I if, feel like you're, if you're gentle. Yeah, gentle touch. Just Good touch gentle. only. Just respectful, <laughs> gentle touches. I don't have a problem with really, you no. know. No, I don't want my work touched. Don't <laughs> touch your work. I have, char I have charcoal in it. 
And I don't want that like picking up, you know, on somebody's finger. <laughs> Maybe wash your hands first. That'd be great. <laughs> okay. Gallery roll, no touching. <laughs> so we have um, two minutes to spare. There's one more question. Did it? Um, no, we answered that already. So any last words from the panelists? Carl and everyone at Five Points, thank you so much for showing my work. Yes. It's been uh, a wonderful experience dealing with you, very professional experience. Um, I am very happy with everything. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I'm going to send it back to you, Carl. All right. Well, I just wanted to highlight the two artists that were not able to join us tonight. Um, both who had family emergencies. Um, the work here is by Adam Bernard. Um, and he actually um, uses a cake decorating piping bag to um, intricately pipe on all of these little dots. And I do have a little video that I can play for everyone. If I can find it. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the crazy wow. person. Time lapse, I would say. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And let's see. And then we have Deborah Weisberg, or not Deborah Weisberg. No, sorry. Right. Um, Margaret Wilson. Margaret Wilson. Um, who also had a family emergency, um, but her work is just as stunning. And these are tiny, right, Carl? Six by five inches? Yeah, these are very small and matted and framed and gorgeous little pieces. Are they on canvas or board? I think they're on like a yuppo paper or you. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. All right, so thank you everyone who signed, logged in and joined us this evening. Um, Wonderfully Tactile is open through February 7th or 12th. Um, and we will be publicizing, publicizing the new gallery hours. Otherwise we are open um, Tuesdays through Saturdays, one to five and Sundays also one to five. Um, the new gallery hours will be 11 to five. Um, so oh, uh, if you want to, any last minute questions, just type it into the Q&A and we can look at them and try to answer your questions there. But uh, I will leave it at that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rico. Thank you. Thank you. This was a pleasure. Carl and Rico. Really great. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. And have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. See ya.